one. Ooh, welcome to the Fourth Line Podcast. This is July the 6th, 2021. With you today is myself, Carl and Stevie Nick. And here we thought we'd be talking about a Stanley Cup champion tonight. We did. I mean, we, we came a day late so that we could make it happen. And yet, Tampa listened to their, their mayor. Like many good law-abiding citizens do, mayor said, bring it home to win it on home ice. And they made it happen. That that lady really shouldn't have said that. Like, like I don't really believe in in superstitions or anything like that. But that's it's just kind of dumb, right? Like, why would you lose a game and start risking that slippery slope towards losing more? Just win. Yeah, and like, there's a little bit of superstition. Like, if you if you were even a little bit superstitious, saying that would throw you off entirely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but I, I, I had no faith in the Canadians. I, all of yesterday, I was like, it's over tonight. It's over. even during the game. I was like, Tampa's going to win this. They may have fallen behind. They'll tie it up. They'll like, even, take it yeah. in overtime. Even when Montreal was winning game four, I still thought Tampa's going to win this. Yeah. I definitely did too. And then Josh Anderson came out with this huge burst of speed in overtime where like, where do these guys get their energy from? (laughs) And where was that the rest of the series? Like, I know that he scored two goals yesterday, but like, Josh, don't save it all for game four. He seems to like float to the surface every once in a while when they really need it. And then he kind of disappears again. Yeah. And I mean, they kind of needed it a lot in this series. Well, yeah, they needed it leading up to this point, not just in this moment. So it's not a great characteristic to have for a player. No. I think every team has those players, right? And like, for sure, they label them as like clutch players, which also means that they disappear a lot of the time, the rest of the, when they need them. Yeah. And that's why it's it's they're all the more visible when they show up to score that goal. Yeah, because we haven't seen them this entire time. It's like, oh look, look who look who did a thing. But I, Josh Anderson, would you, like sure he had two goals yesterday, but for me, most of the series and most of the playoff, I maybe would rather have Max Domi on this team. No, come on, no way. I with what. With what this team is doing, the fact that I look, the fact that they sat Cockneyemi yesterday and went with who was it accepted? Jake Evans stepped in for him. Yeah. Like the fact that they won that game is just going to solidify to them that that was the right choice. And that is absolutely not the right choice. Yeah. I, I, I didn't quite get the reasoning behind that. I, I must have missed the part of the pregame show where they explained why that decision was made, but Kakanyemi should have been playing last night. And I get like re rejig the lines. Absolutely. Right. Something has to change. You can't just run the same thing out there that you've done the first three games and hope for a different result. But Kakanyemi draws back in right for tomorrow. He should He better. Like I get it. You won with him, not in the lineup, but now you've got him. You add on the fact that like Thomas Tatar is just a healthy scratch as well. Forever. (laughs) I forgot about that guy. (laughs) Right. So like you've got them. They started the playoffs with Cole Caulfield in and we've seen what he's done. Sitting these scoring players is not going to help you. I get it in the regular season. You got to teach them a lesson. It's about consistency. You know, it's about playing a certain way for 82 games. But in the Stanley Cup final, (laughs) now it's not the time to teach them lessons. Like you need that skill in your lineup. And look, if we're teaching lessons, why isn't, if they're using it as a lesson, why hasn't Josh Anderson been set for the rest of this series? Right? Like there's a lot of guys that haven't shown up who've needed to. Why haven't you tossed Jake Allen in there on some of these more shaky carry price nights to teach him a lesson? Picking your spots on teaching these lessons, like you said, 
the Stanley Cup final is not the place for that. It's not the place for that. You need Kakanyemi. Kakanyemi has been, you know, let's use the word again, clutch in some very key moments in these playoffs. And, and you got to let him play. And a good performer. I, I agree with shaking the lines up. Like, I think, obviously, the remade Anderson line worked last night. Um, I think, you know, moving around the Deneau line was good too, but the uh, got to gotta get him back in there for game five tomorrow. So, um, okay, let's keep, let's keep going on this clutch theme because, you know, we were talking about how clutch players generally disappear and then show up in important moments. Here's someone who doesn't do that that I consider clutch, Blake Coleman who scores diving goals in the playoffs, apparently. How amazing was that goal with like 0.3 seconds left? Unbelievable. The fact that he, I mean, that whole play from even from where the, I believe it was a neutral zone turnover yep. that got them going the other direction. And like with seven seconds left, Montreal still had the puck in the neutral zone, went the other way. And the fact, the pass, the dive, it was all amazing. And I mean, I'm very glad that it was a goal because like that with a save at the end of it wouldn't have been that elaborate of a save it would just been like a like guy carry price coming across. So I'm glad he scored. Agreed. It would have been a nothing play if it was a save, obviously. But the fact that he scored with that little time left on the clock, just like it was, it made the game so much more exciting. It actually kept me watching through the intermission to bring me back for the third period. But guy, wanted- I wanted to see how it, how it happened. And you know what? Tampa used that. That was a game they probably should have lost. That was game two. Yeah, that was definitely Montreal's. Even though Montreal won game four, that was Montreal's best game. A hundred percent. And Tampa, you know, they just, they were not there. And then that goal happened and that launched them. Like that gave them the momentum and the confidence to, to play out the third period and hold on for the victory. It was like Blake Coleman not only launched himself forward to get the puck, but he launched the entire team forward. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I love that. I do have a question for you though, because I very much feel like Blake Coleman has disappeared for substantial pieces of this series and also the entire playoff. I was that a question? <laughs> Which I now realize <laughs> is not a question. I just have a rebuttal there. I have a, I will, I have something to say. I mean, like, I don't think he's really, I don't have his ice time in front of me. I'd, I'd, I'd gander that he's, he's, his, his deployment is not that of a top six forward. Well, we know that because he's in the, he's playing 15 minutes a night. That's actually more than I thought he'd be playing. Yeah. Actually, no, that was regular season. What's he playing in the playoffs? Playoffs, he's been playing. Uh, this doesn't tell me. Oh, there we go. I know. No, that's not helpful either. Come on, hockey reference. But don't you think that that him and Gord and whoever that other that other player is on that line? I find them very visible, actually. He's playing 16 minutes a night. Um, yeah, I'm with you. Like I I think that I mean Gord has been been doing well. And uh, uh, he's total points wise, he's clocking in at eleven points in twenty two games, which is like you know, forty bad. point season is pretty good, right? Um, and I look at what, like, I, I don't think of him as clutch and also a con- consistent performer. I think like, yeah, he does some things like that, but I think driving the scoring wise, like being the, being a, a leading goal scorer, isn't something that we see from him. No, but that's not his role on the team, right? That's not that line's role to go out and, and drive goal scoring They're They're supposed to be banging the bodies around and, and grinding it out and um, uh, smothering the opposing teams forwards. And I think they do that very well. And then they turn around and score goals at opportune times, like on the penalty kill or with 0.3 seconds left in the period. Okay. Now, so I guess then this, this is on me then for misinterpreting what counts as clutch. Because when you think when you think when I think of a clutch player, I think of someone that's going to make that timely offensive play. Yeah, I don't think I've ever thought of a clutch defensive player, but that absolutely is a thing. 
I mean, we're we're making this definition up as we go right now. Yes. So it can it can absolutely change and sway and and swing both ways, but I think it can exist in in both directions. Yeah. I think that's definitely the case, right? I think we can we can have that with a good defensive player being clutch. I've just never thought of that. Now I need to reevaluate everything about clutch. All right. Well, we got like 40 minutes left, so we can talk about this all night if you want. I guess. Well, so I do have one. Now I actually have a question. I will okay. I say I have a question. I will ask a question this time. Okay. Do you think that there is, and maybe we've talked about it this year already, and if we have, I apologize in advance. Playoff performer. Do you think that that's a thing? That there are playoff performers and non-playoff performers? That there are clutch players and non-clutch players? Yes. I think so. Like, are, are you defining playoff performer and clutch player as the same thing? I, I guess in, in theory, those would be two different They'd be two different pieces. things. I mean, I like, it sounds like there's two questions. Yes, I think there are playoff performers and non-playoff performers. I think a perfect example of that right now is, is Corey Perry. And I know he's had a very long career and, you know, maybe they signed him just so when they made the playoffs, he could play the way he's playing now, but he was a healthy scratch throughout the season. Yeah. And now there's no way that they'd be scratching him. No, he's been a huge part of this playoff run for them. Yeah. So to me, there's an example of a playoff performer. And I do think, I think with the way that this, the game changes in the playoffs, I know that I think that that is a little bit of a over, like overly dramatic thing that people say, like, oh, you got to play playoff hockey. I think that if you're very good, like Tampa Bay, you can just keep playing your style of play and win in the playoffs. But what what does change is officiating, right? And that changes so you, that you can play a little more physical style. You can get away with some more of those things that you can't get away with in the regular season that would make you a liability on one hand, but not in the playoffs. I actually think like playing quote unquote playoff hockey is being able to change and adapt your game based on where the officials are calling are drawing the line. Because to me, that's what changes with the officials is, is, is the quality of calls. So like, what can you get away with in this game? Where's the line for the penalties? And if it's that much higher, then you got to play that much harder and play that much more physical. But if the bar is very low and they're calling everything, you got to adapt your, your game and, and hold back that physicality a little bit and play a little more skillfully. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I, and I definitely agree. But yeah, this is this officiating. I mean, this is a topic we, we didn't talk about pregame. It was something we wanted to talk about, but I've, I'm still kind of baffled by the lack of consistency all over the ice. Yeah. Well, and we saw what in the middle of game four, Gary Bettman went on uh, the Hockey Night in Canada broadcast. I'm sure he also was on the American broadcast um, and stated that he thought George Peros in the Department of Player Safety has been doing a good and consistent job this season which is literally not true. Okay. But two things on that. First of all, he has to say that. (laughs) Right. Because he's, he's the employer and he's got to back his people up. Second of all, if he didn't believe that, wouldn't George Peros be gone already? Yes. So Gary Bettman, to me, like, it's not just a matter of him having to say that he believes that. Which which is is, another problem. (laughs) This is a whole other problem. It's baffling. Yeah. But uh, I definitely officiating still, still a struggle that we've had of what is and is not. We saw that last Monday as we watched the game, right? We saw in game one, we've seen it throughout the rest of this. What is and isn't is a wild card. Absolutely. It's been a lot of blood, I feel like, in this series. <laughs> yeah. And like half of it's been from Brendan Gallagher. <laughs> so, with these games, like we've had some pretty big Tampa's been putting up some big numbers. Do you think that this series has been uh, as far apart as those scores have indicated? And the fact that we were, you know, 
multiple posts. Tampa hit what three posts last night? Yeah, they did. We're, we're post posts away from Tampa sweeping. Is this as as wide open for Tampa as it seems? I don't really think so. I think the only game that really was that way was game one. Montreal just did not seem like they were there and they were ready to start that series. And that game was, was five to one. We talked about game two, Montreal probably should have won that series. And that was a three to one score. That game. Yeah. Game three was six to three. Um, to be honest with you, I don't remember when all six of these goals happened. <clears throat> Two of but, them were empty netters. Okay. So, so it's not as, again, it's not as, so we're talking four, three. Exactly. So not as, uh, not as big of a gap there as, as it would appear to be. And then game four went to overtime. And game four, of course, went to overtime. Not a very long, I find that overtime in these playoffs have not been very long. I know it's been very disappointing. I want like a real, like I have not had a stay up late and have make regrettable choices. There was one night I want to say it was Vegas, Minnesota had a, had a late one. I think that was the only series that I was like, this is a poor choice, but I'm doing it anyways. Haven't had that opportunity. Yeah, it feels like they've all come within kind of the first 10 minutes of, of the first overtime. Or there, I think there was one that went to three, but it was an afternoon game. Yeah, that's and right. Those, and those just hit a little differently when it's not one in the morning. <laughs> they absolutely do. So with, with us sitting here, uh, I picked Tampa in five, which still have possible. Mm-hmm. I believe you had them in six. Is that right? I had them in six. Where are you sitting with that now? I think it'll be over in five. Do you think tomorrow night handed out Stanley Cup? Yeah. I think when when you've got a team on the edge like this in the Stanley Cup finals right up against the ropes, uh, very rarely do you see these teams giving up more than one game. They don't like having the carrot dangled in front of them. They lose one in overtime. They're going to come back harder tomorrow. Yeah, I think we're going to see Tampa really come out and uh, and do do what they need to to wrap this series up. Con Smythe prediction. Oh, I think I'm still going Braden Point. Yeah, I'm with you there too. And, and that and- hasn't really changed at all throughout the playoffs, has it? Anytime we've talked about Tampa. For the most part, I mean, he's been he's been very consistent. Obviously, that streak he had of of goals and points was leading that. Uh, interesting thing. So I'll give full credit to my research on this to Mike Laborn. He actually wrote an article for the site. If you haven't seen it, go to the fourthlinepodcast dot com and read more about what I'm about to tell you. But he uh, he looked into it, and so sixty four percent of the time that a skater wins the con Smythe, that person led their team or the entire playoffs in points. Oh, um, interesting. So like we're, we're really coming to the point where that's going to be the case. And there's even, I mean, the in, many of those instances where the leading point score didn't win, they were on the losing team, which I believe there's what, if I look at his article, I want to say there was only been four times that a player, not five times, um, that a player that wasn't on the winning team won the con Smythe. Yeah. They, those must be like ancient history. I remember the one J.S. Shiger. Yeah. Saddest picture ever taken. Yeah. Uh, we do have, let me see. Is this correct? No, that's not correct. Um, I thought I had it here, but it is not, is not there. So we've yeah five times J.S. Shiger is one. Um, and, I'll go to the site definitely. and check it out. Check out the other four. Head on over there and find out what ex- what is more because there's more that I could tell you. But anyways, it seems if, even if we use that 64% chance, brain point is going to take. It. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. I don't think it's going to a goalie this year. kozlowski has been good, but not good enough. And Carey Price hasn't been good enough to win on a losing team. Yeah, agreed. Babe, speaking of Carey Price, did you see his reaction to that OT goal last night? Sorry, it, lack of reaction. I was going to say, it's like no one scored. Like, you would have thought that it was an intermission break. 
<laughs> that guy is just so zoned in. It's it's so weird to see like a lack of intensity, but he's just so calm and cool and collected. He's just zoned in. Goalies are all over the map. You either have like the guys who would have, you know, slid on both knees to celebrate that and have like jump under their teammates. And you've got Carey Price that it looked like they were just going to commercial. Like, yeah, oh, grab, exactly. grab my water and head over to the bench, I guess. <laughs> exactly. So game five tomorrow, both teams flew into a tropical storm today. Yeah. Uh, Bill Daly actually said they're monitoring the situation. They have a little bit of flexibility when it comes to scheduling, but as of right now, there's no change in the game time. Which is wild. The fact that after all of this season, we might have a Stanley Cup final game delayed a day because of weather. The one thing you can't control. Uh, and weather in like not a blizzard, <laughs> which I, <laughs> I know we had that this year. You're right, though. But for hockey <laughs> to be canceled by like a tropical storm versus a blizzard, that's kind of funny. I mean, I can only imagine how difficult it will be to maintain good ice in a tropical storm. Yeah. It's going to be, whether they play or not, that's going to be a tough situation. It, it, uh, it will be a tough one. And, you know, what, do we know when the Olympics start at this point? No, I'm still shocked that there are Olympics. But, I uh, kind of am too. But remember a few weeks ago, we, there was all this skepticism about they're going to be right up against the Olympics. Could there be delays? They haven't had to delay a single game in the playoffs, and they're on track to finish well before the Olympics start. Yeah, the Olympics are starting on the 23rd. Uh, game seven is scheduled to happen on Sunday. And that flexibility that Bill Daly talked about, there's an extra day off. Well, there's not an extra day off because they're supposed to play Wednesday with Thursday off, Friday, and then Saturday off Sunday. So it looks like they would push that back and kind of just move into Monday. If um, a little bit, yeah. And, and extend that. So, Well, we uh, shall see where... That nets out. Absolutely. We've, we do have, I mean, other things are starting to happen that week. We've got the expansion draft happening July 1st and the draft Mm -hmm. July 21st. Did I say Mm -hmm. the first? You said the first. Yeah. So the 21st is the expansion draft. The 23rd and 24th is the entry draft. Uh, And so lots of movement there. We will have players signed all over the place. So by the time we are back here next week, the Stanley Cup will be handed out, whether it be tomorrow, Thursday, maybe Monday. Maybe it's handed out live in an extended Game 7 on Monday. That seems unlikely for several reasons. Yes, it does. uh, We'll we'll be here and we'll be taking you through the action of the offseason. We've got a lot more news that happened this week as well. The NHL awards are handed out. We had some signings as the off-season business fired up. So we're going to take a break here and be back on the other side. Three, two, one. So it's award season, apparently, and we're going to get, we got all the awards without having to sit through a cringy ceremony. It's so much nicer this way. This is the way it should be done. Do this going forward. Just tell us. Yeah, just tell us. And you know what? If they want to have a big party with all the award recipients and stuff and celebrities, they can go do that. They don't need to put cameras in there and show us. I mean, I think back to a time when I won an award um, and the ceremony that I received was I got to go watch The Lion King in theaters. And so why doesn't the NHL just like plan a big movie night and get everyone out? And that's how we celebrate. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Live action Lion King or OG cartoon? OG cartoon. The award that I won was I finished the first grade. <laughs> Are you the only one who got that award? <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a very tough school that I went to. Standards were incredibly high and they should not have been, but yes. Um, I was the only one in my family who won that award. Ah, yeah. Well, congratulations, Carl. Belated Thank congratulations. You. Thank you. It's about what thirty years too late, but nonetheless, still I counts. It. And I'll still take it. 
So you were uh, you were quite the rookie back then, huh, Carl? I that was only the second second movie I'd ever seen in theater. So yeah, yeah. Quite, so that was quite the rookie. That was kind of your Calder Trophy, kind of right. Um, speaking of Calder Trophy. <laughs> I was going to say 30, 30 years later, your successor was named. It took that long for, you know, lions, I think take that long to mature and really come into their own. Um, much like Kaprizov did winning this trophy for the Minnesota wild other finalists for the award, Jason Robertson with the stars and Alex Nedeljkovic, a name that we now know how to say for the Carolina hurricanes. Oh, the goalie. The goalie, yes. That, you know, that this is a solid list of players, but I don't think there was any question that it was going to be Kaprizov. Of the ones today, and maybe I'll re-ask this when we get to our, our next awards, but this seemed like the easiest decision. Yeah, right? I think so. It was pretty... Like, he made a splash at the start of the season when when it when he got started and he just maintained that momentum. It feels like throughout the entire season, he was always in the highlight reels. Yeah. It was definitely one of those. I mean, much like when Panarin came over, right? Like he's an older player. He's played pro hockey for a while in, in this instance, in the, in the K and I was a, was a seasoned veteran already. And you could tell that. Oh yeah, you can tell. And he just he elevated that team to to be a playoff performer. You know, we did I don't believe we had that team in our playoff picks at the start of the season. No. Um and then they took the Vegas Golden Knights, one of the top two Finnish teams in the league to seven games. Yeah. So, you know, he was a huge huge part of that team's success this year. I don't really know where I stand on the whole should these older players coming over later in their careers be considered for the Calder discussion. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I do think that that's an important thing. Maybe because I think the age that you count as a rookie goes all the way up to like 25, I want to say. Does that sound right? Something around there, yeah. And for a top star player, certainly like you should not, you will very likely not have someone because he's, I mean, he's 24 now, start of the year, he was 23. Um, For these star players, you won't have them peaking at that point, right? Like yeah, most rookies are 18, 19, 20, I guess 19 and 20 when they win this award. So for a Calder trophy, I get it. But for like an actual rookie, I think that if someone's a prospect and they're developing and like, you know, they're not a high end prospect, but they still make it in. I think that that's still a a fair thing to say, Hey, like we'll celebrate your rookie season. You count as a rookie and you're eligible for all those things because you earned that. And for those players that play like five, 10, one game in the NHL, I think that they deserve that kind of recognition. So would an appropriate split be like Calder trophy for best first year performance in the NHL and then a rookie of the year trophy or like most improved or start yeah, to think, muddy the waters a little bit. I think there is a way to make this better. Um, maybe call it like a breakout player of the year. I mean, he still would have won that though, right? Like yeah. for a player, like yeah, he would have been that breakout player or the, the unexpected performer or bounce, I guess not a bounce back cause he didn't have it, but I do think that it would be an interesting thing because even if you were to use like playing pro hockey in any league as a metric, you've got 17 year olds coming into this league that have done that. And then you're disqualifying all of them from, from making this as well. So I think that's a slippery slope. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's an interesting discussion though, for how we decide to look at, at this award and who it should be handed out to. But I don't know. I don't know if there's much else to say on this one. Like he very clearly deserved it. I don't think there's room for argument for anyone else. No, absolutely not. And I, I think I I do agree with you that it would be nice to have some sort of a way to measure this. But at the same time, I mean, he was drafted 
by the wild in 2015. It's not like he, you know, dodged all of this. Like he was a Minnesota prospect, just took what longer for him to come over. So while it, while it, I do have a, a sense that I'd like it to be better. I also don't disagree with him winning this. Yeah. Yeah. All okay, right. What's the next one? Next up, let's do let's do the best defenseman, top defenseman of the league this year. Uh, nominees were Adam Fox, Victor Hedman, and Kale McCarr. This, this is the one, one that I wanted to ask you about. This one going to Adam Fox. Bit of a surprise selection, no? I think this was. I mean, for a lot of people, they. You know, because this was his obviously his big coming out party, not a rookie, so not eligible as the the rookie of the year, but like his first great season, and I was impressed by it. But certainly, for a lot of people, when he even won this award, they said, "Who is Adam Fox?" Yeah, I mean, he's to me, he was just sneaky good. He kind of flew under the radar all season you didn't really start hearing about how great of a performance he was putting up until much later into the season yeah i think a lot of the like advanced analytics people really kept making a a strong push for him as the year went on and it kind of became a a big thing at by the end now it doesn't he have a bit of a funny story for how he broke into the league he he came over from uh ncaa right and he signed as a free agent um so he was a a college player but he was drafted by the flames actually then he wasn't gonna go to calgary kind of the same way that we've seen like jimmy vc right he ended up a a similar thing he was like i don't want to play with the flames so he was included in that dougie hamilton trade to carolina and then essentially he said the only team i want to play for is the rangers and so they got they got a second and a third, which when you look at a second and a third for a Norris winner, not enough. But oh yeah, uh, when you when you really don't have much much for options, Carolina did the best they could. Must be nice to be the Rangers, huh? Just have all these good players who just want to play for you, even though you're a terrible team still. Yeah, it, it helps you become a less terrible team. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. So, so how, how are you feeling about this with the Kale McCarr and the discussion? Adam Fox had a very good season. He did not have a better season than Kale McCarr. He also didn't, I would, I don't think he had a better season than Victor Hedman. Now the bar for Hedman is so high that like you expect it to be peak Hedman and coming off the playoff run that he had last year, I think it would have been difficult for voters to look at what he did now and say, well, you know, it's worse than his con Smythe win. So I'm probably not going to vote him to win this, but um, I think Fox should have been third, which isn't to say he's bad. I just think he's the third best defenseman in the league. But, but what's more impressive, the performance that Adam Fox put up for a team like the Rangers who did not even make the playoffs or the performance that Hedman and McCarr put up on two of the best teams in the league, if not the best teams in the league. Like, don't you think that that Fox's performance should be, should have a little more weight to it because of the team that he was on? I, yes, I do agree with that. Absolutely. But I also think that those teams are very good in part substantially because of those two players. The like Kilmacar is a big piece of why the Colorado Avalanche are as good as they are. Victor Heaven is a big reason why the Tampa Bay Lightning are as good as they are. So I look at that. I'm like, yes, if, if, if this was a situation and you know, it is to a degree the case, but like when we had that year where like Kucherov was up for the heart and Hedman for the Norris and Vasilevsky for uh, Vesna, it's like, yeah, of course this team is, is very good. Right. Not the case this year, right? Kucherov gone all year. Victor had been having to step up, and I, I think yeah. he did a very good job of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a – they're all great points. My my next question, and I don't want to go down a huge Google wormhole, so if you don't know it, that's okay. When was the last time a defenseman won the Norris Trophy where the team didn't even make the playoffs? 
Ooh. Well, let's see. That can't be very common, right? No. We had, well, Hedman last year. Yeah. Hedman, no, Hedman didn't win the Norris last year, did he? Uh, I can't remember. We're going to do Roman Yossi won it last year. And then I'm just going to, I'm just going to quickly take a look. We had Yossi, Giordano, Brent Hedman. Eric Carlson's potentially was the last one. Eric Carlson in 2015. I'm not sure if the Senators made the playoffs then. Otherwise, we're looking back. I want to say, I mean, this is this is back to like I have no idea territory, like mid 90s at the very latest. Yeah, yeah, I I would think so. It's a, I, I guess the point is it doesn't happen very often. No, certainly not. And I, yeah, so it might perhaps the Eric Carlson ones, but I feel like even the 2015, I feel like the Senators made the playoffs that year. Does this, I think you're right. I think they did too. Um, does this now springboard Adam Fox into being talked about in, you know, the same conversation now as the Hedmans and McCars and Latangs and Carlson's and, you know, like, is he that class now in that class at that level of defenseman? And I think he has to be. He he was just short of being a Calder finalist last year, which, like, would have put three. I'm not sure where Quinn Hughes slotted in the voting. If that would have put three defensemen as the Rookie of the Year nominees, which I think is unheard of. Um, but, you know, having that for him and now winning the Norris just one year later – you have to be right. And I think we'll see as, as this year comes up to see what kind of repeat performance he can put up because he, he did get better and take a big step this year. And so can he maintain that step? Cause it's a high bar to maintain, but I think he's good enough to do it. So another piece falls into place for the New York Rangers. They've yeah. got their number one defenseman. Absolutely. And now they just need some more guys to get better. They've got a coach. Everything's going pretty well for the Rangers. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how they do next year. Definitely. All right. Next up is the Vezina award, which goes to the top goaltender in the league. This one had another Tampa Bay lightning and another Colorado avalanche. Philip Grubauer, Andre Vasilevsky, neither of them won. This went to Mark andre Fleury, who after all this time gets a Vesna. Has he not won one yet? I do not. I believe that is, yes, that is his first time even as a finalist for the Vesna. Wow. Okay, then I'm less angry about this. You not feel that like I was this... angry. I just like, I heard Fleury and I was like, really? Yeah. Fleury? Like, I know that he probably overperformed for his kind of age and what we expect from him at, at this point in his career. But I still thought there were other goalies that played bigger roles on their teams. I think what made it tougher for Flurry was that how good Robin Lehner was as a backup. Yeah. And like they won the Jennings award because of both of them, but this was, I mean, statistically, this was his second best season or his best season ever on a, a you know, per game basis. And I think that that's great for him. That's think- it's unbelievable at this point in his career, how he continues to improve like that and continues to, to hold his team up. And like, it's, it's really impressive. He had a sub two goals against average this year. Yeah. Like that we have, I mean, I, I know that they're trying to bring scoring up, but still sub two is really good. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know who else had a sub two goals against average? I don't. Philip Grubauer. Woo-hoo. He's actually who I thought, well, not thought would win, wanted to win. Uh, I think that he's, he's the one name on this list that wasn't expected to play as well as he played. Yeah, he definitely outperformed. He overperformed for sure. And I'm like, I'm no goalie expert. I'm no goalie guru. I don't, I don't really understand 
goalie stats or how they play, play their game. Cause they're weird, but he was the one that, you know, when, when the awards talks and nominees were released, I was like, really Grubauer. And then you look into it and you're like, wow, really good. He had a better goals against average and flurry. Well, and, and he was one that he was, like all, really all three of these goalies flurry was honestly is is honestly the flashiest of the three yeah when it, it comes down to i mean Vazlevsky can definitely make some of those amazing behind the back saves grubauer is the least flashy of the three of them and i think when it comes to goalies that hurts right when it just comes down to just solo positioning it's not going to get as many votes as it would if it was just purely based on a computer trying to figure it out well, and you're, you're not going to get on the highlight reels every night, which honestly I think hurts with some of these awards because it's it's the media voting for it. So you're counting on votes from writers and reporters across the country. Well, and, and I think if we look at um, like Adam Fox being in the time zone he is, right? And the fact that, uh, and Marc-Andre Fleury's not, but uh, who was in the first Kaprizov middle I, I honestly thought because of the lack of playing against other teams this year, that it would be even more East coast bias just because more teams are in that time zone than there is on the West coast. Yeah. But inter- you know what? I would have assumed the same thing. And interestingly enough, it didn't fall that way. Which I like, I like that means that the people voting on this are not just basing it off of what they see. They're taking the time and actually putting that thought. in. I also really liked they made the entire ballot public. Yeah. I like so that too. Everything that the professional hockey writers voted on, you can go and see what each writer voted. I love that transparency. Yeah. I totally agree. All right. It brings us to the final one, the heart trophy, the most valuable player finalists, Austin Matthews, Nathan McKinnon and Connor McDavid with the win was, was this as much of a slam dunk as the Calder or was this a little closer of a race? I think it was as much of a slam dunk as the Calder. Yeah. I don't think it was close not even it. close. Should be Connor McDavid's second heart trophy. And it should be at least his second. Yes. The, I mean, wait, is it his first? Yeah, it is his first. Yeah. Because dry sidle won, but he should have won that one. <laughs> uh, Nathan McKinnon should have won that one. Nathan McKinnon absolutely should have won the hard trophy last year. Okay. But we're not going to open that. <laughs> we're not going to open that door again. We've had that conversation, but he I think with, he, if, if an oiler was going to win last year, should it have been dry sidle? No. Should have been McDavid. It should have been McDavid. And this year was McDavid's second. He actually won in his second season. Okay. I thought he did win before. Yeah. Didn't, didn't even win the Calder in his first year. He took that Adam Fox like bump to suddenly winning everything in his second year. But I mean, McDavid's been a finalist now three times. He's won it twice. He's 24 years old. Come on. I mean, he's the best hockey player in the world right now. And it's not close. No, it's not. He can, he can carry that team incredibly far. I look forward to seeing what they do to surround him, which there was some news this week about some of those pieces that are surrounding him. First one, uh, we'll start with the one that's some solid, firm news. Ryan Nugent Hopkins, the proud owner of an eight-year contract to stay in Edmonton, $5.125 million a year. Yeah, I think we disagree on this one. I thought that was a good deal for Nugent Hopkins. Yeah, I took I'm okay a pay cut. with it. But do you think, I mean, with what we know about the salary cap right now and how it's going to move, we have no idea. I can We can assume it's going to go up eventually. For these next few years, it's going to be pretty stationary. He had to take a pay cut because eight years from now, when Ryan Nugent Hopkins is 36, he's not going to be worth $5 million. No, but that's the uh, <laughs> that's the team's problem. <laughs> but that's I mean that's why he had to take that pay cut, right? Like you want that yeah. stability, you want that long term deal, you got to take a cut. But I think terms is meaning less and less these days because teams are finding ways to move these contracts. 
right? Like, like you, you, you give them the term, they give you the, the, the average annual salary or average annual value that you want. And then you throw in the no move clause, uh, to, to ease the, the demotion a little bit from a financial perspective. Well, you say that it's becoming easier for them too. He does have that no move clause in this. So it makes it more difficult now for them to move him if they wanted to. Well, because he controls his destiny. He tells them where, where he wants to go, but at 5 million bucks, that's a much easier, like that's a much easier amount to stomach. Even if you have to retain salary, retaining 2 million bucks, two and a half million bucks, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. So that when he, when he decides he wants to go to the New York Rangers in the future, then he, they can just make that happen. They can make it happen pretty easily. Yeah. I, I was very much, I mean, the, the, dollar amount i wasn't too surprised by that seems about what i would have expected especially signing it this year yeah but just the length of it i was i was taken aback by contracts can be moved they can be buried if they need to be i just think that it it's harder right now than it used to be and i think it might be getting even harder well like what's the priority for the oilers right now keeping their cap hit low in the present or freeing up their cap space in the future? Current cap space is their priority. Right. And that's what this accomplishes. So it's, yeah. it's a problem for future GM after Ken Holland retires. Right. When Ken Holland's <laughs> gone, this is not his issue anymore. Although the max term is the classic Ken Holland move. Let me tell you. You've, you've seen a couple of them. Oh my goodness. I've seen a couple of them. So the other rumored move is that Duncan Keith is on the way out of Chicago and he wants to go to the West Coast, family, etc. And it sounds like Edmonton is the leader in the clubhouse for acquiring Duncan Keith. Yeah, don't do that. Why do they want to do that? Again, this is a classic Ken Holland move. <laughs> it does seem so can you can you, is there any example that you can think of off right now? that is similar to this move that Ken Holland has done that we can look at and say, Oh yeah, don't do that. I don't, I don't know what the rumored returns for Duncan Keith are right now, but I can tell you one year, Ken Holland traded a first round pick for a rental of David Legwand. That's yeah. That's not good. Like don't do that. But Ken Holland's such a big believer of experience and heart and and culture and leadership. And he overpays for it frequently. I saw it for 20 years. Well, I shouldn't say that. In the cap era, he overpays for it. Right. Well, and, and so now we have, I mean, Duncan Keith has two years left on that giantly long deal. Uh, cap hit of five and a half for those two years. Obviously, he's going to be playing this year. One would think he would still be playing the year after that. So two years of Duncan Keith. I think, I mean, he still has something to bring, but I think taking on that full cap space is not worth giving up much of anything. No, no, the Blackhawks should be paying them to take it on. And then maybe you'll get something back. So it is interesting. There isn't a lot of talk about that, but uh, definitely sounds like likely before the draft, we'll see a Duncan Keith move. Yeah, but it's kind of interesting based on that conversation we just had about Nugent Hopkins because this is what we were talking about would be happening in six years on this Nugent Hopkins deal. They're going to have to be moving five million of caps of uh, of cap hit, right? So, like, at what level do you take Duncan Keith? If the Blackhawks retain two and a half, do you, do you take him at two and a half? Yeah, I mean that's a good point. I. Most of me, what I like is how quickly you showed me how wrong I was. In that. <laughs> but yeah, if they can retain half of that and it would be like just over two and a half, I, I would give up an asset for that. I'd give up like a pick or even like a, a mid-ish pick. Like I, I don't understand why either of these teams would be against that. Two and a half million is kind of easy to swallow at this point, especially for both of these teams, uh, at least for the Blackhawks, I think. I don't have their cap friendly page up, so I'm going off of memory. Yeah, I mean the Blackhawks have almost everyone 
still locked up for this coming year. Like the pieces that matter. Um, very few RFAs that need to be dealt with and lots of cap space. So I don't know. They should be getting creative for how they can break up that cap space a little bit. I mean, we saw it at this year's trade deadline. Maybe call up Seattle, see how they can help. Always, always ways to call up Seattle and find out how they can help. If they do, I believe, with what we have here, I think Jonathan Taves coming off the IR, and it looks like he will be. He went for a skate this week, and things are looking like they're progressing for his return to the ice. That might eat up most of this cap space for Chicago. Yeah, he's supposed to play this coming year. Which is great. Yeah. Very so, weird set of... I don't know if you watched a video the Blackhawks put out that kind of explained the whole thing. Just a weird set of circumstances that happen with him. Yeah. And I mean, he still doesn't fully understand why he was out or what led to it, but just knows that he wasn't right. Yeah. So he took the time, he got better and now he's skating again and he's expected to play, which is great news. Absolutely. We have had another big contract handout, almost identical amount. Uh, Joel Erickson Eck, eight years, five and a quarter per season to stay with the Minnesota wild. Yeah. I don't know why (laughs) is like, is this a good deal? I don't, is he a good player? I mean, he's, he had a very good contract year for the wild. He's scoring in a shortened season. He scored almost as many goals as he has the rest of his career. And what was the cap hit on it? Five and a quarter. It's not a terrible cap. It is like, are we going to have the essentially the same conversation we just had about Ryan Nugent Hopkins? I think I would rather Nugent Hopkins than Eric Zanek at this dollar amount though. I agree. I think, I think I would too. And I don't know if I'm locking up over 5 million in cap space. I don't know if I'd want it to be in Eric Zanek considering yeah. how premium cap space is right now. Absolutely. I'm with you there. Well, there we go. That's the news of the week. Anything, any last thoughts before we wrap up the show? Well, kind of regardless of, of what happens tomorrow, we'll be doing a Stanley Cup episode next week. Stanley Cup will be handed out. We'll probably be talking about what's next for the offseason. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a busy couple weeks ahead before we have to get into our offseason content. Which was... Animals and geography, if I recall correctly. <laughs> Something like that. We should probably talk about that and hammer that out a little more. We should. I mean, it sounds pretty hammered out from what I just heard. <laughs> so tune in for that. But first, tune in for our show next week. We should be back on Monday. Thank you for those, uh, those that reached out and said, where are you? Um, but we're back today. Glad to be back. You can head on over to our Twitter at fourth line podcast with the number four to play high, low sticking where you pick for maybe just one more time this year. Uh, if you think the goal total will be over or under, it will very likely be exactly five goals. Last game was a push. So you, Mr. Brody was certainly happy about that and everyone else who picked that, but he's been picking push every time he can this entire season. So good for him. Uh, head on over there, play that. We'll post the tweet during the day, reply to it. We'll remind you. Thanks to everyone who's played this season. It's been a lot of fun. Meet new people and just having the chance to play with there. Head to the fourth line podcast.com. You can read the um, Mike Laborn article mentioned earlier in the show and find all the places to find us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. If you like the show, please leave us a review. Thank you very much for tuning in this week. Until next time. It's time for us to wrap up another fourth line show. I know what you're thinking. You don't want us to go. If the Oilers take Duncan Keith, he will be a crutch. But when he was in his prime, Carl, would you call him clutch? I would. There you go. 